So you have knee arthritis and your doctor may have recommended a cortisone injection and you have questions. Is it safe? Will it help me? Should I do it? Will it hurt? Um, and those are questions that all patients tend to have. And in today's video, I'm going to go over all of that information and more. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Adam Rosen. And please, if you have not already, please subscribe and like so people like you find information like this and you get updates when new videos come out. And be sure to check out my book, The Knee Book. So in today's video, let's talk about cortisone injections. And I'm going to jump right to it. So maybe you're going in for a cortisone injection and you have a lot of fears. I see a lot of patients that when I talk about cortisone injections, they have this huge look of fear in their face. Like they expect this huge needle and this horrible pain. So let me walk you through actually what happens. So you can basically do the cortisone injection with the patient sitting up with the knee bent, hanging over the edge of the table or lying down. And what you'll see here, there's four marks that I made um, on this patient's knee. And these are the four most common locations. So we can inject along the bottom, what we call inferior medial, inferior lateral. Um, and those are typically done with the patient bent, um, with a bent knee hanging over the edge of the table or the top two, what we call superior lateral or superior medial, and those are more commonly done with the knee straight, so the kneecap is relaxed. So you can do this in one of two ways. This is the way that I do it, and this is the way I teach it to our physician assistants um, and our nurses and, and fellows and even primary care doctors. I like to feel the knee with regular non-sterile gloves, um, and then I can poke and palpate all of the anatomic landmarks and make a little dimple with the cap of the needle. And then at that point, you then sterilize the skin. So I commonly use this medicine called chloroprep, which is an alcohol-based chlorhexidine preparation to clean your skin. Some people will use betadine. Um, in any event, you're sterilizing the skin, but you can't touch it now because it's sterile. And then I'll use some numbing spray. This is ethyl chloride, which can be used. There are a number of other products on the market that you can use. And it not only freezes the skin, but I also find it tends to distract patients um, from the needle itself. But once the skin is frozen, then the needle pokes through the skin. I always tell people you'll feel a little pressure because it's numb, and then you'll feel a pinch because as the needle goes through the capsule of the knee, most people feel a little pinch at that point, and then the needle is within the knee joint. Now, studies do show that you do not need ultrasound guidance. If you know what you're doing, you do not need ultrasound for certain joints like the knee. Now, the hip is a different story. It's a deeper joint we can't feel, ultrasound guidance is necessary, but in the knee, it's not necessary to use ultrasound guidance. The needle goes into the knee joint. You squirt the cortisone mixture in there, which is also mixed in with some local anesthetic, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and you withdraw the needle, you put on a Band-Aid. I tell people you can remove the Band-Aid in an hour. If it's a little sore, you can use some ice or Tylenol, or if there's not a contraindication and anti-inflammatory. Sometimes the numbing medicine actually lasts for a couple hours. So people walk out of the office um, it's great marketing. They walk out of the office feeling great, but it's numb from the numbing medicine. Uh, but that numbing medicine wears off. And most people see the effects of the cortisone within two or three days. And in most patients, it may last up to three to four months. And you can repeat this um, in three to four month intervals, depending on the patient and the amount of pain and the amount of arthritis that they have. Now, the common side effects and things that we worry about are things like infection, because we're poking something through the skin into the body, but the risk of infection is extremely low. Pain is another potential complication or side effect, depending on how you look at it, but it's typically short-lived. Very few people get pain after, but some people can get what's called a steroid flare. Uh, the other common thing that we see, though, is with diabetic patients, and diabetic patients might see their sugars go up for a day or two. So I always joke with my patients, like, your sugars go up. It doesn't mean that you can have chocolate cake and blame it on the cortisone shot. Um, but if you're checking your sugars, it's pretty common to see the sugars go up. Some people really, really high. Um, so we'll talk about another drug shortly that might be used as an alternative to cortisone. Um, but for most people, those are the common sort of side effects. Now, you might be saying, well, what about osteoporosis and things like that? And, and yes, Steroids as a class of drugs can cause weakening of the bone, but that is more typically seen in people that are taking prednisone pills or getting IV cortisone treatments for certain diseases. That has a huge amount of systemic side effects, um, but the amount of cortisone that we inject into the knee or into any joint for that matter, and the amount that gets absorbed systemically is extremely small. Um, so that risk is not something that we typically see. Okay, so that's sort of 
getting that out of the way, um, that's sort of cortisone in a nutshell. Oops, I left this out. And this is the beauty of editing. I can put this into the clip. So if you have pain on the inside and we inject on the outside, it goes to the same place. So the balloon analogy is what I like to use, that if we could inject this red food dye into the balloon with a needle without popping it and we shook the balloon up, that red dye goes all over the inside of the balloon. And the same thing happens in the knee. So if you have a Baker cyst and pain in the back of the knee or pain on the inside of the knee and the doctor injects it on the outside of the knee, just realize that your knee is a bag. And as soon as you get up and walk out of the office, that fluid goes everywhere. So the cortisone does get the effect that you need all over the knee. It doesn't stay localized just to where the needle went into the knee. And now back to the rest of the video. Now, um, other ways that you can do this. Some doctors will choose to use sterile gloves and they will sterilely prep the leg. So once they prep your knee, they have sterile gloves. They can then poke and feel and know where the needle is. But you need to know where it's going because I do see patients that have holes in weird areas um, and had pain, which means that the doctor doing that probably didn't know what they were doing or where the actual injection was going. So you need to be able to palpate landmarks and know where that needle is going. Now, what do we mix in with the cortisone? So you can add local anesthetic. So things like lidocaine or more commonly marcaine. Um, there are different concentrations. Your doctor will talk to you about this, but you know higher concentrations in some of those drugs can cause damage to cartilage. So we use much lower concentrations um, and typically the local anesthetic that is least toxic to the cartilage, what we call chondrotoxicity. Now, cortisone, there's a whole bunch of different cortisone preparations on the market. Um, I personally have used all of them. I have not seen a significant difference in my patients. A lot of times where I am, I'm just basically relegated to whatever was bought by the institution. Um, some practices might have multiple options and choose for different reasons to use different cortisones. Now, the old cortisones used to be more crystalline. So I remember early on in training, um, we would inject cortisone multiple times, and then you would do knee replacements, and you would see all these white crystalline deposits throughout, throughout the knee. Most cortisone preparations nowadays are soluble. So typically when we go into do knee replacement, you do not see any effects of the cortisone on the tissue within the knee itself. Um, now, some people might say, yeah, but isn't cortisone bad? And what I try to explain to people is that I don't inject cortisone into normal knees. And I use the analogy like back in the day in college when the trainer was injecting huge amounts of cortisone, like four or five times what we do for a typical knee, into the shoulder of the pitcher like every week. That was bad. That person did not have a rotator cuff tear initially maybe um, and did not have arthritis, but they loaded them up with cortisone high volumes repetitively and that can cause damage to the tissue. The people that I'm talking about treating are people that already have arthritis. These are patients that may have failed the conservative treatments like exercise and activity modification and weight loss and pills and maybe are not ready to have a knee replacement. Um, this time of the year when I'm recording this, it's around Thanksgiving, I have a lot of patients that come in that want cortisone now because they're like, I don't want surgery Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. I want to do something early next year. So we do cortisone injections as a way of reducing pain and inflammation, improving patients' quality of life, and delaying the time for knee replacement. Because if we do surgery today, it's a knee replacement. If you have two cortisone shots and we do surgery, it's still knee replacement, and we're not increasing the risk of a surgery as long as we wait 90 days. So there have been some studies that show that if you have a cortisone shot, we want to wait 90 days between the shot and surgery to decrease the risk of cortisone. This is very important, and more and more primaries and rheumatologists are starting to be aware of this because there have been instances in the past, early in my career, we would see someone for the pre-op, they would see their primary for their pre-op, they would have surgery planned, they would come in the day of surgery and say their knee's feeling great. Why? Because they had a cortisone shot two weeks ago and we canceled their surgery. So patients should be aware too that you don't go seeking a cortisone injection from a doctor other than your surgeon because you were having pain leading up to the knee replacement because we will then delay your surgery because there's an increased risk of infection. Um, now, do we aspirate the knee? Sometimes we aspirate the knee. Um, this is the amount of fluid that I got out of one arthritic knee. It's a huge syringe. The fluid normally is this thickened, yellowy looking, almost motor oil. Sometimes there's a blood tinge, like you can see in this syringe. Sometimes it's full of blood, like if someone bleeds into their knee. But not every knee needs to be aspirated. Some people just have pain and we inject the cortisone. If your knee is swollen and painful and arthritic, 
typically what we will do is numb it up, drain it, and then do the cortisone injection. Now, what about other options? And you've seen, if you haven't seen, you should go and watch my videos on PRP injections, and you should watch my video on the visco supplements or the hyaluronic acid injections. There's two other videos on that. But the other option that's out there that I admit up until a few years ago I was not aware of, and many surgeons that I talk to aren't aware of, but it is another option. Um, so this is what's called a Tordal injection. Now, Tordal is an anti-inflammatory. Cortisone is an anti-inflammatory, but cortisone is a steroid. So this is an anti-inflammatory that is a different class of drugs. It comes in pill form. It comes in intravenous form. It comes in an intramuscular form, but we can also inject it into the knee. And there have been a few studies, one of which we recently reviewed at one of our journal clubs, that showed it's pretty similar in effectiveness to reducing pain for about three months in arthritic knees. Um, now, the benefit of this is if someone doesn't want a cortisone um, preparation, they don't want a steroid, this is an alternative. If someone is diabetic and had significant elevations in their blood sugars, this is an alternative. Um, what we don't know and what has been theorized is that since we're not modulating the immunology of the knee, could you do this sooner than the 90 days prior to surgery and would there still be an increased risk of infection? I don't know. I'm not sure there's a clear study. There might be one out there now, but we might find out later whether or not that is safe and what the interval between the injection and surgery should be. Um, but essentially, this video was here to just put your mind at ease. Maybe you have a cortisone injection planned for tomorrow and you were scared. A lot of my patients at the end of this, prepping the skin, uh, spraying it with the cold spray, injecting the cortisone, putting on the Band-Aid, it's not uncommon for patients to say, when are you gonna give me the shot? You know, it's over. Or spouse will say, honey, you know, he's done, you can look. And, and they look down like, oh my God, you're done, I didn't feel it. It is not something that should be horribly painful um, for most people. Now, when patients ask me, is it painful? The way I describe it, because not everybody will have a pain-free injection, is that if you go to the lab and you have your blood drawn, there's basically three kinds of people. There are the people that will continue talking to you like this while the phlebotomist is drawing their blood, but put on a wrap, the patient says thank you, and they walk out the door. There are other people that will get their blood drawn, be nervous, the needle goes in, and they scream or yelp or ouch, and they get a little anxious, and then they put the Band-Aid on, but then they calm down, and they walk out. And there's the third patient that is really anxious, gets the needle stick, passes out, um, and has a horrible response and thinks it was the worst thing in the world. And any of those patients can have any of those occurrences uh, when they're having a cortisone injection. But for the most part, the majority of the time, patients that I have taken care of over the years have a preconceived idea of this horrible experience and are happily surprised at the end that it's nowhere near as bad as what they expected. So I hope this information was helpful for you. Until next time, stay safe. I'm Adam Rosen, and thanks for watching.